This is called Hawk Lawler. Hawk Lawler was born in Kansas City in a charity ward where his father was also born. Perhaps in the same bed, his early childhood was that of any Negro child of his town in the 1930s. Regular, attendance at a seedy rundown school, daily salutes to the flag, solemn morning pledges of allegiance and standard beer geographies. A special interest in history led him to build a makeshift log cabin in his backyard in preposition in preparation for the presidency. When his father tore it, out, tore it down for firewood, as soon as he discovered what motivated Hawk, Hawk cried. His favorite friends were those with whom he traveled to the relief depot to collect the family ration of potatoes and dry prunes. These boys he trusted. Others just happened to be boys, too. In school, he was good in mathematics, but hated to do figures on paper. He usually worked out arithmetic problems in his head long before the rest of the class rested their pencils. He attended church each Sunday at the Rising Sun Baptist Church, where he secretly sang hymns in numbers because he didn't like hearing the same words all the time, yet could offer no resistance to the music. His first personal contact with music as an individual act was when he played triangle in the school band and discovered that when he pinged his instrument at the wrong times, he could feel its tingle separate and distinct from the other instruments. At which times he would smile inside his mouth while apologizing to the leader, who was an ex-New Orleans musician that jazz had passed by, yet secretly enjoyed the hard hit. He discovered the saxophone while listening to the band tune up and found that his gilded pipe could play free of the mob. At that instant, he became a saxophone player for life and never touched another triangle. The only possession of which he was proud was an aging Elgin bicycle he received at Christmas from the Afro-American Doll and Toy Fund sponsored by the local Negro paper and provided for by all good white people of the town. It was given to him during a bleak Roosevelt Christmas for winning the school's annual composition contest. His subject was, Why I Want to Be President. And he was proudest when the bike was presented to him by a snow-bearded, colored Santa Claus whom he recognized as the mayor's chauffeur. This cherished trophy he remembered and showed to Horton son of the family his mother washed for, in return for one of the battered saxophone which he slept with three nights for feeling intimate enough to try it. And when he did finally find sufficient courage to blow it, his die was cast. He and Horn were one, world blotted out. The only two courses available to him outside of regular studies were the Bible and music. And since he preferred playing the saxophone to being God, his choice was preordained. Before long, he was being heard in small local clubs with largely blues clientele, often experiencing that same feeling about words he had once felt in church. He began to blow numbers. He was fired over and over, yet couldn't stop, stop, stop blowing numbers. He was hired as second chair with the Bat Balls Orchestra with the provision that he refrained from blowing numbers, which he did until the band's dilapidated bus pulled up in front of the Teresa Hotel on Harlem's busiest corner in New York City, where without a word, he picked up his horn case and disembarked. For no reason at all, he walked and he wondered. He had never seen so many Negroes at one time in his whole life. He wondered if some big dam had burst in Africa and spilled its contents, uh, or laughed at the crazy thought that they were all white 
and this was some special holiday when they all wore black and brown faces for some religious Mardi Gras. This speculation was soon replaced by sounds smacking into his eardrums, which dispelled any notions of masquerade, causing him to finger his case and peer into doorways for that big, hidden jazz womb. Oozing blues and down warmth welcome his new shoes, but still empty of his embryonic numbers. Strange, melodic numbers, whose sum total was the blues, and so personal, no Arab would have acknowledged inventing them. His numbers, each one a fragment of a note. In lieu of finding a room, he found a girl, which was easier in a place where there were more girls than rooms. And while he waited the chance to blow his lover horn again, he blew numbers with his body, which left him sperm poor and brain pained, longing to give wind to numbers and breathe life into them. One night his girl, mother, sister, lover, whore, had a five dollar date at one of the better after hour spots with a leading writer of detective stories. And since this writer was a favorite of his, he went along, taking his horn as always like some tubular security blanket. Five minutes after he enters the place, God created earth, Christ was born, and Gabriel exchanged his trumpet for a saxophone. For there in this headquarters of black revolution sat these long sought comrades blowing numbers. Illegal notes floated in the air as though they had a right to floated right into his suddenly blossomed ears, followed him up to the bandstand, crept into his pores as he decased the horn, placed it to his parched lips and sighed, for without willing it, they came. Numbers, notes, songs, battle cries, laments, jazzy songs, tribal histories in cubist and surrealist patterns, and an unmistakable call to arms, to jazz to him, as others put down their horns in silent thanks that he had come, as the drums had promised he would come, come to lead into the unpromised land, littered with pains, odored of death, come to the lead with his pumping, grinning throat. Let us not get into it. We all know he led, though we don't know all how. Some of us are more familiar with the intermissions, aware of the passions, privy to the junk, witnesses to the uprising when the handkerchief was cast off. Some of us were counters of madhouse excursions, and few of us have withstood the silence, wondering from where it came. But some of us have to know. Thank you. Bob